So today we are talking to Dr. Nicholas Balderson, a research assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Um, we are discussing his paper published in the Journal of Neuro Neuropsychopharmacology in July 2021 entitled Proof of Concept Study to Develop a Novel Connectivity-Based Electric Field Modeling Approach for Indiv Individualized Targeting of Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation Treatment. So thank you for being here today. Um, just to start off to get a little bit of background about, background about you is um, how did you get into like neuroscience research writ large, but also um, studying something like major depressive disorder? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I didn't really have a very uh, direct path into neuroscience or uh, psychiatric research. Uh, and, and in fact, I started out uh, as an undergrad um, thinking I was going to be a business major. Um, and, you know, if you go back even further, like I didn't really know that I was going to go to school, did a little construction, um, you know, in between high school and college. But um, as an undergrad, I took a neuroscience class and the, the textbook was uh, written in such a way that it, it described research from the perspective of the individuals in the lab. And I'd never really read a textbook like that before. And it really opened my eyes up to the fact that this is actually a possibility. This is something that people could do as a job, you know? And I, I didn't think that that was a possibility for me. I didn't really have a lot of career counseling back in the day. So um, I didn't really know how to apply to grad school and I applied to a few. Uh, ultimately, I applied to a uh, late, application cycle opening uh, at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee and luckily was able to uh, get a slot and um, you know from the first day actually from the second day of being in Milwaukee having never really thought of going there before I was in a lab meeting and I had an office and I had uh, senior grad students mentoring me and from then on um, I was a neuroscience researcher and it was really it was really amazing. Um, and from there, I think what has just carried me is momentum and good career guidance and having a collection of mentors that really um, helped me get through the process. Um, as, a, as an undergrad, I did a pre-doctoral fellowship uh, with, with a group in France looking at uh, fear conditioning with uh, magnetoencephalography that really got me interested in fear and anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I did a postdoc at the National Institute of M Mental Health uh, under uh, uh, Dr. Christian Grian. And there I really got interested in understanding anxiety in a little bit more uh, like for, at, at a fundamentally deeper level and understanding anxiety and cognition interactions and how those are mediated by uh, systems in the brain. And we started to, we formed a collaboration with uh, Dr. Uh, Holly Lisenby, um, who is uh, the director of the Division of Translational Science at the NI, NIMH Extramural Program, but she also has a lab in the uh, Intramural Program. And we started doing uh, TMS work and anxiety. Um, and from there, I got the position here at Penn and, uh, when, when I when I joined the the faculty at Penn, I, I started at the Center for Neuromodulation and Depression and Stress, and really started thinking deeply about how um, how brain stimulation is affecting brain connectivity at a, at a fundamental level, and trying to model that as accurate as possible. And that's really where this paper came from: is just trying to reduce the number of assumptions uh, as much as possible and try to use as much of a data-driven approach, data approach as possible to try to understand how stimulating the brain might affect networks and systems in the brain, which then uh, might affect uh, the ultimate behavior. So that's, that's kind of how we got to where we are. So um, stepping back a little bit, can you describe like what uh, TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation is and like how it's sure. utilized? 
Sure. So the basic idea is that you have a uh, uh, small magnet. Uh, well, I guess you could say a medium-sized magnet. Uh, most often it's in the shape of a figure eight. And uh, when you pass electric current through that, it generates a magnetic field. And that magnetic field can then generate uh, an electrical field uh, inside the brain. And when it does that, it can activate the brain cells uh, directly below where you place the coil. So depending on where you place the coil in the scalp, it can activate uh, different parts of the brain. Um, the really interesting thing is depending on the uh, pattern of stimulation, um, you can you you can you can induce different types of activity in the brain. So you can either upregulate or down downregulate brain activity at the at, at the site of stimulation, which um, can then change the uh, the connectivity of that region with the rest of the brain. Okay. Um, so why is something like TMS used in something like major depressive disorder, but like other disorders, like just general generalized depression and that type of thing, it's not utilized so frequently? So, you know, you know, I think the, the short answer is we use it because it works. Uh, uh, the, the longer answer is, to the best of our knowledge, there are... Um, there are functional connections between the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and other regions of the brain, including those that are important for the default mode network, like the subgenual anterior cingulate cortex. There, so there are the, these connections that are, I don't want to say dysfunctional, but they're either over or under um, activated in depressive disorder. And one of the one of the main hypotheses for how TMS works with depression is that it uh, normalizes those connections to some degree. So if you give somebody uh, enough enough stimulation and enough treatments and enough sessions uh, with the TMS uh, targeting that uh, that connection or targeting the region that's connected with the default mode network, you can normalize those connections and then alleviate the symptoms to some degree. Um, okay. So. I, I think that we're still trying to understand exactly how it works, um, but that's that's our best guess for how it works in depression at the at the current moment. So, in like looking at your study specifically, um, the participants were uh, the large majority of the participants were unmedicated. Is that because like medications frequently don't work, or is that something due to like the bias of like picking people? So I should say that the the study that we're talking about um, was a prospective proof of concept study, mm -hmm. and these these individuals were not given brain stimulation. So okay. these were these were individuals that were collected as part of a uh, larger study for understanding just the brain systems involved in depression. Um, so for that study, they had their own, you know. Um, inclusion ex exclusion criteria. Um, for the specific uh, research project that led to the paper that we're talking about today, uh, I really use that data as uh, as just a data set to probe how, um, how TMS m might potentially affect connectivity and how that might be related to symptoms using uh, computational models uh, to uh to simulate what might happen with the tms so um i used an approach called electric field modeling where you try to see you know where in the brain the energy is going to be deposited if you give stimulation at a particular spot on the scalp and so the idea is that the change in connectivity is going to be proportional to how much uh how much energy you can get into the brain and where you can put that energy so yeah, so it seemed like this modeling like improved uh, like the under the greater understanding of what the TMS was doing. Um, is something like is this modeling that you did in this paper something that like clinical settings or treatment settings could do, or is it something that's kind of utilized only in the lab currently? I think the the short answer is um, with this study and a, a lot of the other uh, sort of advanced targeting studies with TMS. 
they're mostly done in academic research settings, uh, primarily because they rely on collecting um, pre-stimulation MRI, and okay. that can be expensive in a clinical setting. Um, and also, the tools that are used to do the the uh, analyses are not they're they're available. They're available and they're open source, but they're not widely implemented in non-academic clinical settings. Um, so at this point, really the the analysis that we're doing is a proof of concept analysis that potentially, you know, if it improves the targeting and it makes people better, um, could be down the road, you know, implemented in a clinical software package. But uh, I think that that's pretty far down the road. Yeah, so speaking of like a little bit down the road, uh, zooming out a little bit, this is obviously a treatment-based paper, but what do you think in the field of MDD is needed to get a greater understanding to not only treat MDD effectively, but also like trying to prevent the disorder in the long run? That's a good question. I don't know that I have a really good answer. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit um, and say uh, what, what I really think think is interesting about this paper is that, you know, we're proposing a novel modeling technique to understand how the uh, brain stimulation affects brain connectivity and how brain connections are related to behavior so that, so that we can potentially individualize that um, in a systematic data-driven way. What I think is really cool about what we did is that the targets that we identified both at the individual level and at the group level, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, replicate what has been shown to be effective uh, in terms of treatment in the past uh, for depression, which I think is really cool. But I think that's a that's really a first step. Uh, my my main focus uh, as a researcher is on trying to develop uh, new treatments for uh, disorders like PTSD and anxiety, where we don't have like an FDA approved uh, treatment. And we don't really know the optimal treatment targets for these disorders. So if we could show in depression that we have targets that we know that work and we have an analysis strategy that uh, gives us these targets, maybe we could use that analysis strategy in other disorders where we don't necessarily have an a priori target and come up with a, a data-driven target and see, and see how that might, um, see how effective that might be. So, I realized I didn't answer the question that you asked, but in terms of like understanding where the field is going and, you know, future directions, I, I think that the, um, the utility of this analytic approach is going to be larger in, in these disorders where we don't necessarily already have uh, good treatment targets. So is transcranial magnetic stimulation something that's, used in PTSD currently, or is there like just no treatment of it at all? No, it's definitely used. And there are quite a few active uh, uh, PTSD clinical trials ongoing with uh, TMS. Um, I, I know that not all of them have been successful, but I know there are active trials ongoing. And it seems like the uh, the treatment parameters used in depression are in fact helpful for those individuals who are suffering from PTSD. So mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, some degree of overlap in the symptoms. And so there is some degree of overlap in the uh, treatments as well. Um, but I still think that there's probably room for improvement. Um, and I, I don't know that there's anything really FDA approved yet for something like PTSD or generalized anxiety. Um, so I, th I think that there's more work to be done. Yeah. Do you think that like the foundational research on like the neurocircuitry of like depression and PTSD and anxiety, like those things have kind of been skipped over and we're in the treatment part and we still need to clarify that? Or do you think that that research has been clarified to the degree that we will be able to and, you know, with our technology? I, you know, honestly, I think that, I think that there's more to be done from a mechanistic perspective. Um, we know we you know we know that the DLPFC uh, target seems to work for depression. 
Um, and we, we know that uh, if you stimulate the left side, that's, that seems to be effective for depression. If you stimulate the right side, that seems to, uh, albeit with a different pattern, that seems to be more effective with anxiety, but we don't really have a clear understanding for why. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that there needs to be more mechanistic research done understanding, you know, what these differences are um, and why, you know, sort of there, there is this uh, laterality effect. Um, and, and really, I think that we need to understand, you know, better uh, the mechanisms that mediate this, this, these disorders. So I, I wouldn't say that we, we've skipped over those, but I, I think that there are simultaneous like um, basic science and applied science pathways that are, you know, narrowing in on the best treatment approaches. Um, um, so I meant to ask before when we were talking about the uh, transcranial cranial magnetic stimulation. So is something like this type of modeling something that needs to go through full FDA approval or can it just be adopted in, an, in addition to the already approved TMS treatment? I think, um, I, I think that the first step would be to show that, uh, let, let's say for, let's take depression, for instance, let's say that this modeling significantly improves treatment outcomes for depression, which we have no evidence to suggest that at this point, I should say. But let's say that that's the case. I think that in that case, you would need to, in order to make this standard practice, you would need to uh, go through the approval process to get it approved as an alternate like treatment for depression. Um, I, th- I think in the in the case of um, something where we don't have uh, like another disorder where we, where we don't necessarily have a, uh, a a really good treatment site, potentially you could use this modeling approach to identify a treatment site and then define a set of treatment parameters based on that site that then doesn't necessarily depend on the model. So for instance, if we if we found that, and again, we don't have evidence for this, but let's say we found that parietal stimulation might be something that could be um, effective at treating anxiety, we could, uh, uh, we, we could stimulate the parietal cortex and develop a treatment protocol for stimulating the parietal cortex that could be either individualized or not individualized. Um, and if it was effective, then we can put that through the process of getting FDA approval. Um, th- those are all things that I've not been involved in as well. Right. I've never really done anything with the FDA. Um, Fair enough. Um, so my final question is, if you could wave a magic wand in your field or, you know, even in outside of your field, um, what would be one thing that you would change, you know, to better the research or the field in general? Um. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know that I have a good answer for that. Um, I think that. I think that we need more studies um, where uh, people are prospectively assigned to uh, uh, prospectively assigned to groups that get different treatments. Um, and less of what I've done in this study, which is a, a proof of concept. So I guess I guess the short answer is I want to really go out and use this modeling approach to see if I can make the stimulation better. Um, mm-hmm. So use this in actual clinical trials. Um, and I think the first step to that is the, the project that I'm starting now, which is to test whether or not the change in connectivity is proportional to the energy that you get into the cortex. Um, So really validate that model. But I think this is a little bit rambling, but I think the, the, the answer to to answer that question, I think that I'd love to see um, testing of these, these models in, in actual patient groups um, Mm -hmm. with, with high enough ends to show, you know, appropriate effect sizes. So when you, just to clarify, so when you say like looking at the 
like output versus the input um is that paired with like looking at the symptoms also so you would like look at if that change in output has changed the symptoms so i think there yeah that's a really good question so there there are two basic assumptions uh to the model that we we put forth in the paper the first assumption is that when you stimulate the brain you're going to change the connectivity of the brain and that change in connectivity is going to be proportional to how much energy you get into any spot in the brain um, mm -hmm. or any two spots to be more precise. Um, but that's an assumption. Like we, we don't know if that's the case. So okay. um, we need to really, the first step I think is to, to validate that. Um, then the second step or the second assumption that the model makes is that if you change the connectivity in the brain, your symptoms are going to change proportional to how much the original connectivity is associated with the symptoms. So let's say that, let's say that I have a given connection in the brain that's correlated with symptoms at like 0.5, you know, uh, you could almost use that 0.5 correlation as a slope to say, if I changed the symptoms by this much, I should, have, I should change the connectivity by this much, you know? Um, that's another assumption of the model that we really need to test. My my first step right now in the in my current project is to test that first assumption mm -hmm. in a in a sample of healthy volunteers where I give them data burst stimulation and I measure their connectivity before and after and I really um, I use the model to predict what I think the changes are going to be following the data burst. And then I test whether or not the predictions of the model are, are carried out um, in the empirical data. And if we can show that, then I think the, the next really big step is to say like, okay, given that brain connectivity changes as a function of energy uh, deposited in the, into the cortex using TMS, then, then now we can really test that second assumption and see if we can make the targeting better and more individualized for folks. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that, that makes sense. Thank you for... Uh clarifying everything. And thank you for uh, talking with me today. It's been really interesting. Sure, no and, uh, I'm glad, always glad to hear about new research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.